Okay. Uh, thank you, Paul, for the um, introduction. Um, it's uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today uh, and tell you uh, about the collaborative projects my group at Roswell Park Cancer Centre uh, has uh, performed with Selector uh, over the past several years. So, by way of uh, an introduction, uh, my uh, research interests primarily focus on understanding how somatic alterations in cancer cells contribute to tumor genesis. And specifically, this is centered on the discovery of cancer driver genes, uh, in particular tumor suppressor genes um, and networks associated uh, with breast cancer, uh, with the goal of understanding uh, how uh, these genes and the molecular programs that they regulate um, affects not only tumor initiation, but tumor evolution uh, and uh, disease progression. Now, over the past couple of years, uh, my group, uh, in collaboration with uh, Alex Chenchik and his R&D team at Selector, have developed a, a high-throughput uh, in vivo functional genomics platform that allows us to directly alter the expression or function of multiple genes simultaneously. Um, and this uniquely enables us to uh, assign different cancer cell phenotypes uh, to specific genotype-dependent perturbations. Now, more recently, uh, we've begun to leverage uh, these mouse models as well as human 3D organoid systems uh, to discover uh, genetic vulnerabilities of metastatic breast cancer uh, as a starting point for developing uh, new therapeutic modalities. And so today, uh, I'm going to provide you with a sort of high-level overview without going into the granular details of several studies that we've uh, recently performed. Now... Uh, work in my lab uh, is focused in th on three major uh, questions. Uh, first, uh, what are the genetic driver events uh, that are required to convert a normal mammary epithelial cell into a, a neoplastic cell? Uh, second, how does cell identity, in other words, the cell of origin, uh, as well as phenotypic plasticity facilitate uh, malignant transformation. And then third, and perhaps most importantly, uh, how do these early initiating events uh, shape tumor evolution, in particular uh, with regards to breast cancer progression and metastasis that we know is the primary cause of breast, can uh, breast cancer associated morbidity and mortality. Um, so why is this important? Why am I telling you about this? Well, as shown in this slide, we know that there is a clear correlation uh, between cancer patient survival and tumor stage. Um, and specifically in the bottom panel, you can see how patient survival decreases uh, with increasing tumor stage, where low tumor grades uh, can be treated very effectively through a combination of uh, surgery, chemotherapy, targeted agents. However, treatment options really become extremely limited uh, as the disease progresses to stage four, where metastatic breast cancer uh, is a terminal disease uh, with a five-year relative survival rate around 30%. And this number hasn't changed much over the past 10 to 20 years. Um, now, research uh, specific to metastasis has lagged uh, in comparison to primary tumor studies. And that's somewhat ironic, given the fact that 90% of all cancer-related deaths is due to metastasis. Um, now, there are major hurdles uh, that prevent uh, discoveries from being made and hamper uh, the improvement of clinical studies with not only metastatic breast cancer, but other metastatic diseases. Um, and I sum summarized several of the, the major hurdles that we've, we've, we've had to, to overcome, which are uh, associated with not only logistic challenges uh, to collect human metastatic tumors, these material really is not available, uh, even in comprehensive cancer centers, uh, challenges associated with tumor heterogeneity, uh, as well as robust experimental systems that allow us uh, uh, to mechanistically investigate uh, the crosstalk that not only occurs between heterogeneous cancer cells, but between cancer cells and uh, cells within their microenvironment. So that includes, obviously, immune cells, stromal cells, uh, endothelial cells, and so forth. Um, so 
we now appreciate that breast cancer is an extremely complex genomic disease um, and is um, really a collection of uh, different diseases with variable genetic, molecular, spatial, temporal, and environmental underpinnings that modulate uh, not only therapeutic responses, but uh, long-term patient survival. So what I'm gonna tell you about now are the, or some of the strategies and methods that we developed to identify and characterize not only tumor-initiating uh, drivers, but metastasis-promoting genes uh, through the creation of advanced breast cancer progression models in, in mice. So, So this next slide is really a, a, a graphical summary of the comparative oncogenomics workflow that we've developed over the past several years uh, to nominate uh, candidate cancer driver genes using genomic profiles from human breast tumors. And so shown in the left-hand panel, we use clinical data, systems biology, mathematical models to identify driver genes that we interrogate genetically uh, using high-throughput um, perturbation screens. So shown in the right-hand panel, um, this encompasses in the simplest format the use of mammary epithelial cells um, that are derived from genetically engineered mice. Um, uh, these cells are transplanted or engineered with complex uh, libraries to generate pools of mutant cells that are genetically tagged and reintroduced back into mice to monitor tumor growth and progression in what we believe is uh, uh, physiologically relevant settings, but done in an extremely uh, fast and cost-effective manner. Uh, so we can study hundreds, if not thousands, of genes uh, within the same assay. Okay, so we use um, different tool sets uh, to perturb uh, and probe gene function. Um, each of these uh, tool sets or systems summarized in this slide have their own unique advantages and disadvantages, and we use a combination of these workflows. Uh, what I'm going to focus on today uh, is really the top one, which is targeting genes using the CRISPR-Cas system, um, specifically to create target-specific uh, indels uh, on mass. Okay, so uh, CRISPR is really pretty commonplace now in most lab laboratories. Um, and that's really associated with its relative ease of use and its ability to modulate gene function, in particular in vitro. Um, however, the same cannot be said for uh, high throughput genetic screens uh, in vivo, um, which are far more challenging. Um, and this is due to many confounding factors, which are context dependent. Um, some of the, the challenges that we've had to overcome in our assays has been uh, really centered around uh, incomplete target ablation uh, and interclonal heterogeneity, uh, challenges associated with library complexity, uh, limitations associated with the delivery as well as cell transplantation and engraftment. Um, so uh, in close collaboration with Alex and his R&T team at Selecta, and he's really been the driving force of many of these implementations, we've uh, developed and optimized workflows to perform in vivo screens. Um, and so this includes uh, development of algorithms to predict guide RNAs, uh, predict off-target effects based on uh, many, many screens that we've performed to date. Um, this includes modification of the guide RNA to improve stability and spe specificity. It includes uh, development of Cas9 uh, variants that have improved stability in vivo, uh, as well as reducing immunogenicity in animals. Um, we've also incorporated molecular uh, barcodes as well as reporters uh, for quantitative tracing of pooled CRISPR screens. Uh, and more recently, we've adapted these systems for single cell studies, in particular multi ohm sequencing workflows, which I'll touch upon at the end of my uh, talk. Now, a key component of our platform, it's probably the most important part of our platform, has been the generation of lineage-specific uh, cell models uh, for investigating the impact of different um, perturbations on mammary tumor genesis, both to study genes individually and combinatorially. 
So in this particular example, uh, primary uh, mammary epithelial cells can be isolated from wild type mice, so the, these are primary cells, uh, or they can be it, it conditionally immortalized, as shown here with a knockout of P53 and or RB pathways. Um, now these cells are immortalized, uh, they have normal epithel epithelial uh, uh, cell morphology in 2D culture, the cells are estrogen dependent, um, so they represent luminal cells. Um, and shown in the bottom right hand image, uh, P53 now cells can form acini in 3D culture. So these are normal acini, hollow lumen. Uh, they can be induced to differentiate with lactogenic hormones to, to produce uh, milk proteins. Uh, but importantly, they are not transformed. They do not form tumors when injected either into uh, immunocompromised mice or uh, in uh, uh, mice with a, a native immune system such as BALB-C or BLAC6. Um, importantly, they can be converted to malignant cells. And so in this example, we can see that we've knocked out uh, P10 to activate the PI3 AKT signaling pathway, which is the, the most deregulated pathway in breast cancer. Um, and, and these cells uh, can now grow in soft agar. They become invasive, uh, both using uh, a, a scratch boydon type assays, uh, as well as uh, following their, their migration in extracellular matrix. They acquire self-renewal potential. Um, and most importantly, they form tumors in mice with as few as 50 cells. And so these preliminary studies that we performed about three, four years ago now, uh, really established the complexity of libraries that we could suddenly interrogate using complex SGR libraries, as well as gain of function screens using ORFs uh, and uh, peptide collections. Okay, so uh, the assays we perform really in two flavors. Uh, in, they're in vitro based, but what I'm going to talk about today are uh, in vivo transplant based assays that really allow us to screen hundreds if not thousands of genes simultaneously. We've also de developed uh, strategies where we can inject virus directly into animals and create in situ type uh, 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 mutations or lesions. Um, now there's uh, two major routes of injection that we use. Uh, for the transplant screens. The orthotopic shown in the top panel uh, uh, re uh, really is based on transplantation of engineered mammary epithelial cells into the mammary fat pad of mice, or more recently, introductally. Um, and this allows us to, to follow not only primary tumor formation, uh, but allows us to follow uh, 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 transform cells uh, that can evade adjacent tissue uh, invade lymph nodes, uh, follow a subset of cells that can go undergo introversation into the bloodstream, dissemination to distant sites, and colonization in different tissues. Um, and there's a, a, a variant of this assay, which is experimental metastasis, and this is where we can inject cells directly into the bloodstream, either through tail vein or intracardiac injection, um, that allows us to bypass primary tumor formation and really study genetic events that allow cells to colonize and growth in distant tissues. So this next slide is a combination of two papers that are just coming out. Um, and many, many uh, screens. Um, to date, we've identified and experimentally validated uh, just over 400 candidate driver genes. Um, the vast majority are tumor suppressor genes, but there is a subset of oncogenes. Um, about 20% of these genes have been previously uh, annotated, associated with breast cancer. The vast majority have not been shown to drive breast cancer, but there is now clinical supporting data to show that they're tail end mutations. Um, what is interesting about many of the unknown genes is that they are context dependent tumor suppressor genes. They would not have been identified through high throughput sequencing uh, approaches. Um, However, using a combination of epistasis experiments and functional validation, we've shown that many of these novel candidates are uh, uh, interconnected and converge on known cancer signaling pathways and molecular programs. Um, and interestingly, a small subset of these genes, about 10%, uh, uh, can promote metastasis without requiring 
the acquisition of additional somatic alterations or gene genetic driver events. Um, and that's extremely important because uh, there is not much difference between the mutations that we observe in uh, metastatic lesions and primary tumors. Um, and, and today, there are no experimental models really to study this, and we have been successful in identifying genes that can promote metastasis without requiring uh, other uh, co uh, uh, complex uh, lesions. So uh, seeing is believing. Um, this slide really summarizes some of the clinical relevance of screen hits using uh, public tumor data sets. Uh, here uh, is a paper that just come out uh, summarizing 355 tumor suppressor genes. Uh, top left is overlap with COSMIC, so the Sanger uh, database. Top right is pan cancer genes. The bottom two are breast cancer mutations or recurrent breast cancer mutations in, uh, observed in TCGA and Metabric. The bottom right is uh, uh, copy number changes. And, and what becomes pretty apparent is that mutations are not the drivers really in breast cancer. Um, the, the predominant lesions are non-random copy number changes um, in, uh, in this particular example recurrently uh, deleted uh, in breast cancer. And so collectively, this studies and several others sort of demonstrate that many of the genes that we uh, defined using unbiased screens have clinical relevance, not only in breast cancer, uh, but other human tumors. Um, now, beyond gene-centric uh, studies, we performed pathway and network analysis and found that the vast majority of novel candidates we identified in our screens uh, are interconnected. Uh, and converge on known signaling pathways, uh, oncogenic signaling pathways, I should say, as well as molecular programs. Uh, I've summarized several of the core molecular programs that we've identified. Uh, many of these novel genes feed either upstream or downstream effectors uh, of these programs. Um, the genes in green were all identified. They're all known tumor suppressor genes. The genes in blue, uh, colored blue, I should say, are oncogenes that we confirmed independently or through gain-of-function screens. Um, two, screen, uh, two, two particular pathways of interest that have really been long-standing interests of my group, uh, the PI3AKT pathway, specifically studying uh, mTORC regulation and the ability of cancer cells to undergo phenotypic or metabolic plasticity at distant sites, as well as the HIPPO signaling pathway, uh, centered on both canonical and non-canonical uh, YAPTAS regulation. Um, now, something that we've done, which I think is pretty neat, uh, has been uh, to use uh, uh, many of the genes that we identified um, and create uh, something we call functional taxonomy profiling of driver genes. And so uh, it, it, this, this, this is really based, based on creating uh, isogenic cell lines with defined activation uh, or repression of oncogenic signaling pathways. Um, and so we can create reference profiles of model driver genes using not only cell functional readouts, uh, but also molecular readouts of which we've used driver map extensively uh, to, to create robust transcriptome signatures. Um, now, the basic premise of this assay is that known driver genes that cluster in the same group implicate common pathways affected by different perturbations uh, so that the mode of action of uh, putative driver genes can be inferred by similarity to its neighbors. In other words, this is a, a sort of guilt by association study where we, we know the knowns, we don't know what the unknowns do, but based on how they behave, we can begin to assign them to given pathways. And so that's the way that we've done, been able to, to very quickly uh, assign unknowns to known singly components. And a key part of that has been based on uh, the driver map assay, which was developed by Alex Chenchik, as well as reporter based assay. That, that, that we've developed together. Um, so this next slide really shows uh, some of the functional cell-based readouts that we've used to cluster candidates. Uh, in the left-hand panel, these are mammosphere assays. These are assays to measure self-renewal potential that we subsequently confirmed with limited dilution analysis in mice. Um, the, the, on the right-hand panel is invasive assays. So here using a scratch assay, uh, we've used um, uh, 
long-term reproductive assays, so fidelity assays centered on uh, colony formation, uh, anchorage independent growth using soft agar, studying uh, response to, to different nutrients and signaling, uh, as well as looking at apoptosis and anoikis. And in the right-hand pa bottom panel uh, is representative H&E data. And we're now performing multi-IHC on the tumors to be able to stratify the unknown genes based on uh, e uh, 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 the phenotypes that we observe uh, uh, in vivo. Okay, so I've told you a little bit about uh, the screens and the strategies we've used. Um, and I've told you most of that work really, was focused on a really simple question that turned out to be a lot more complex than, than we initially thought, which was um, how can we convert a normal epithelial cell into a fully malignant cell? Uh, the spin of that and, and as I mentioned in my opening intro, metastasis is what really kills breast cancer patients and many other uh, patients. So we wanted to, to adapt our systems to now follow breast cancer progression uh, in vivo using un unbiased assays. So uh, this slide uh, is really a cancer continuum um, uh, where um, we know that uh, breast cancer, like all other carcinomas, develop from normal epithelial cells that evolve and transition uh, through stages of, of growth, so hyperplasia, uh, dysplasia, in situ carcinoma, which are precancerous lesions, uh, and then some cells acquire invasive ability, and a subset of these cells can ultimately metastasize. And this has really represented a black box there is very little difference between the, 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 the mutations of in situ carcinoma and invasive carcinoma. Uh, and so uh, for us, it was extremely important to be, begin to identify novel genetic and epigenetic drivers of this uh, process. Um, so the way we've done this uh, has been through uh, a multi-orthogonal platform. Uh, and this was really a really quite challenging, um, but essentially we coupled in its simplest form four assays. Um, genome editing uh, that's coupled with cell barcoding. This is both molecular and genetic barcoding, where the molecular barcodes can be used as fluorescent biosensors to longitudinally trace cells uh, in vivo in mice. Um, and then the genetic barcodes can be used to perform multi-ohm single cell analysis. So this uh, includes, or shown in this slide, uh, simultaneous on the same cells, single cell transcriptome profiling, as well as ATAC-seq, and more recently we've coupled that with DNA methylation profiling. Um, now, uh, using this assay, uh, and this is unpublished data now, uh, we've been able to show that tumor cells acquire metastatic uh, traits very early in their genesis uh, without requiring additional genetic driver events. So suggesting some cells are intrinsically bad and they reside in the primary tumor. Uh, but depending on stimuli can uh, 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 invade uh, adjacent tissue, uh, uh, undergo intravisation, uh, colonize distant tissues, uh, and in some cases form uh, overt metastasis. Now shown in this slide, we found about 400 genes that can form tumors, primary tumors. Uh, however, only a subset of these genetic driver events can actually um, gain entry into the bloodstream. And only a subset of these genes uh, have the ability to colonize distant tissue. Uh, and this is, uh, some, some of these driver genes are conserved across tissues. The vast majority are uh, display organotropism uh, effects. So some, some driver lesions uh, will promote, for example, uh, metastasis to the brain versus the, the lung. Now, uh, we asked the, the simple question. We now effectively have generated uh, 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 gems uh, or genetic perturbation studying many, many different genes. So what, if any, uh, are the commonalities between metastasis versus matched primary tumor? And what we found was that the cells actually undergo reprogramming and go back to an earlier stage in their development. So metastatic cells uh, revert to an earlier progenitor state 
uh, and the transcriptome signatures, independent of the driver lesion uh, or the model, is dependent on uh, 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 acquisition of, of gene expression programs uh, that occurred uh, earlier in mammary uh, gland development. So I'm not going to go into this uh, in great detail, um, but for the non-breast cancer biologists here, uh, mammary gland development uh, is a multi-stage process that begins during embryogenesis, uh, but mainly occurs after birth. Um, at birth, the mammary gland epithelium uh, consists of really a rudimentary structure uh, that grows in an isometric way uh, with the body of the animal. So from puberty onwards, um, uh, cells undergo proliferation, uh, differentiation, cell death, and regeneration. And the cells that are metastatic are actually hijacking these developmental programs, but they're reverting back to, to early progenitor states. Okay, so we've been able to follow up metastatic cells uh, using here a combination of ataxic single cell to look at the, the underlying gene expression programs. Uh, what we've shown is that these cells uh, are, are, that are metastatic uh, hijack uh, enhancers and super enhancers uh, uh, associated with early development. Um, and for time constraints, I'm not going to go into all the data that we generate on this, but uh, essentially, we found that, uh, that the, the genes that promote metastasis uh, uh, do not require genetic driver events, additional uh, genetic driver events, uh, but these cells display greater phenot phenotypic plasticity uh, that enables distinct states or microenvironmental cues. So something that was interesting from this was we could begin to cluster uh, the phenotypes that we see with disease progression. Uh, so we now believe that breast cancer, as well as other uh, uh, types of cancer, are dependent on proliferation, bypassing apoptosis or cell death, re reprogramming of the actin cytoskeleton. But those processes are not sufficient to result in overt metastasis. Instead, we found that metastatic cells acquire uh, hallmark, uh, uh, pr progenitor hallmarks that allow them uh, to, to uh, adapt to different microenvironments, uh, both metabolic and other stresses. Um, and so as summarized in, in this final slide, um, ongoing work is really looking at the role of phenotypic or cellular plasticity. Uh, we believe the cells revert back to an earlier progenitor state. Uh, so they are cancer stem cell-like, but they're not stem cells per se. Uh, these cells acquire long-term self-renewal potential. Uh, we've begun to show that the, uh, the HIPPO pathway is extremely important for this. Uh, they uh, uh, acquire motility in invasion, primarily through activation or hijacking of PI3 AKT pathway. They can bypass immune escape, uh, as well as express uh, stochastic gene expression programs that allow them to, 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 to overcome challenges or tumor suppressor microenvironments in distinct, distinct tissues. So with that, I'm going to sort of wrap this up and hopefully I've given you a flavor of some of the work that we've done. Um, this is probably the most important slide. You can ignore everything else. Um, so this is a relatively small team that's, that's, that's created or worked on, on this particular project. Uh, includes members of my lab, which was recently created uh, at, at Roswell Park, um, as well as some wonderful collaborators, Eric Newston, uh, Agnes Vikovic, who's helping us with, with the animal models and also the multi-IHC data, which looks really quite phenomenal. Uh, Yaming Zhang's a long-term collaborator of Hippo signaling uh, and its role in acquisition of stem cell traits and, and adaptation to mechanotransduction. Uh, we work with several companies. PHI is a company uh, uh, from Europe uh, that's developed a holo monitor that's allowed us to look at real-time images uh, and phenotypes associated with these driver lesions. And we also work with a company called Seed Biosciences in Switzerland who's developed a really slick single cell platform that's very, very efficient uh, that allows us to isolate single cells and be able to form genomic profiles on them. Uh, and then perhaps most importantly, uh, the selector team. I, I'm not sure if I've forgotten anyone in, in this list, um, but uh, I, really the, the driving force behind this collaboration was Alex Chenchik, um, who's been, you know, uh, 
really fantastic over the past four or five years uh, and, and, and helped us uh, with, with, with developing these in vivo platforms and optimization of reagents. And I'd like to highlight a couple of other individuals, Debbie Deng, uh, who uh, made a lot of our, our vector backbones, uh, Nadia Deganov, who uh, has helped with sequencing, and Mikhail Makanov, who uh, has helped with bioinformatics, uh, as well as analysis of some of the data. Um, and with that, uh, I can either take questions or do we move along with Alex? Okay. <laughs>